because I'm going to so I'm going to talk th through these slides now. The topic is teaching and learning in difficult in difficult circumstances, and what I'm going to try to do today is um, to obviously define what we might mean by difficult circumstances and why do we why do we talk about difficult circumstances. But most of what I want to say today is about how can we, as teacher educators, but also as, as researchers, um, help teachers move towards what we might call appropriate pedagogies for, for difficult circumstances. We could say, originally I had post-method pedagogies because yesterday we were talking about that, or sometimes I use the phrase decentered pedagogies. Uh, I think they roughly mean the same kind of thing, moving away from ideas which may be relevant in privileged circumstances, small classes with many, many uh, resources uh, towards um, thing, uh, ways of teaching which might be more appropriate in the kind of difficult circumstances that I will describe, large classes, low resource classrooms, etc. So the most of what I talk, I'll talk about is relatively practical, but it's got a, um, I've, I feel that research that we do in the field of ELT, in the field of applied linguistics, should be practically oriented, it should be helpful for teachers. So I'm, I'm not, I don't believe in very, very abstract and theoretical um, research. My, my attitude is quite practical, as you, as you will see. So, um, and find, just finally, what, what about uh, what Prem Payak, um, my friend and co-researcher over there in Nepal, has called um, super difficult circumstances. And he talked, to, he talked about super difficult circumstances in relation to the earthquake that you suffered from um, a few years ago. And we, I think, live now, or you will be living now in super difficult circumstances compared with the, the normal difficult circumstances of the large classes, the low resource classrooms. So we'll ha have some final reflections about that. Let's start, let's start with this uh, issue of defining difficult circumstances. We have to go back to Michael West, a British um, colonial educator in, uh, in Bengal, British Bengal before um, independence, well, before World War II. Um, and despite being a colonialist, or well, no, he wasn't, let's not call him a colonialist. He was a part of the colonial education system. But despite that, I would suggest that he was very close to the concerns of teachers that he was responsible for, for training at, in, da in Dhaka, at the um, Teacher Training College in Dhaka, in what is now Bangladesh. And um, he, he uh, wrote a book in 1960, based on all of his experience in Dhaka, with teachers, um, with Bengali teachers, um, helping them to teach in their, their very large class, their large classes. And um, he put all of his experience into this book. One day I'm, I'm going to um, just upload the whole book to my to my website because it's still still useful. I think it's got a lot of practical ideas. The main the main point about sharing this now is that he coined the phrase um, teaching English in difficult circumstances in the title of his book. Um, and he was writing about um, classrooms like this, um, which you can probably recognize, but uh, many of you may be teaching classes of much more than this, even more than 50. Um, Ill-graded means, it's a little bit old-fashioned way of saying things, but it means mixed ability. Um, and um, these, these, these aspects, there are many different perspectives, there are many different ways that we could describe this kind of situation. But the basic point he was making, and the point that I'm making, is that the kind of context he was talking about is very different from the kind of classroom that many ELT methodologists are, are thinking of when they write books for Longmon or for, for OUP or Cambridge, a kind of relatively well-resourced in terms of technology, textbooks, etc. Um, small classrooms, uh, the, the kind of thing that maybe Adrian Holiday meant when he was talking about um, banner, banner contexts. Um, um, Laxman, Professor uh, Ganawali yesterday mentioned banner and tessep and um, so this is more like a, more a kind of tessep tertiary secondary primary school context whereas many methodologies have been developed in in the west in britain in the usa um, in a kind of banner britain australia north american context in small well-resourced classrooms so there's this basic distinction that we we need to we need to draw 
Um, so even West was saying that even in 1960, most of the books on methodology that were being published in Britain were not really addressing this kind of context. Um, and it's still, still a problem, I think, or worse problem even now. The, the issue of large classes, um, he, he says that the problem in 1960, the issue of large classes or this kind of difficult circumstance has been exacerbated, has been increased because he's saying that in 1960 there was a rapid spread of education, too rapid for the supply of buildings and teachers to catch up with the number of pupils, and because of the spread of education over a larger proportion of the population. Well, he was saying that in 1960, but in fact, if you think about the sustainable, the, the sort of um, the goals, um, Millennium Development Goals from the United Nations, uh, one of the main goals was by 2015 to increase uh, numbers of children going into primary schools and actually that was achieved in many places and it, a lot of progress was made i think including in nepal in terms of numbers of children coming into schools uh, in in global south which is what we're talking about we're talking about the global south really well um but um there hasn't necessarily been an increase in numbers of teachers or uh, increase in facilities to meet those needs of the numbers of children. And I think this is recognised in the Sustainable Development Goals, which United Nations has set up to work towards for 2030, that there needs to be a focus on improving quality, not just quantity of education. So I think what he says here about 1960 is very true about and now as well. The problem is not going away, the increasing of large classes, lack of resources. So this is what I always, this is what I share with teachers in workshops, is your teaching context more like this? Well, this is, this photograph is rather old now, but it's because it shows a little bit old technology, but you can see technology, a small class in London, in a, in a language school classroom, a native speaker teacher with um, students from different nationalities. They have a very, very clear reason to communicate in English because they're from different language backgrounds. Language, English is spoken outside the classroom. They have a very obvious need to communicate. There's a lot of flexibility, a lot of freedom in what they do. They are, they are learning English simply to, for practical reasons, not for educational, not within an education system. And there are many differences, many, many differences from these contexts, which are pictures from all around the world um many many different countries in the global south this is a country in latin america and these are schools these are uh, large relatively large classes in terms of numbers of students this is in china so the students all have textbooks but it's a very large class as you can see um this is i think somewhere well, somewhere in um, south asia africa less less resources less less textbooks you can see um but there there are differences but there are many similarities between these contexts, you can see the rows of desks. Um, you can see relative lack of um, uh, physical technology, for example. Um, and you can see these, these the students are all from the same language. Well, usually from the same language background, the teachers from the same language background, they share a language. So there is a resource of the same language that could be used. You know, of course, in this kind of, in the in the kind of context we were looking at before, um that's not so that's not so possible or it's not really um um recommendable but it's also not possible for this teacher um to be using the student's own language and that's possibly why you know uh methods like that direct method or audiolingual method or community language teaching they don't generally recommend the use of the student's uh, own language but of course in these contexts it's a, it's a resource which can be used so there are many differences um, between that first context and these. This is in Pakistan. These are all different. I think this is uh, maybe Nepal. I'm not quite sure. Well, this is in Gaza. Um, so what what I'm saying basically to you is that these contexts share things in in common, which are which are at the same time different from this context. And this kind of context has been very neglected still. In um, UK, USA, Australian, Western uh, academic discourse. Um, it's come into, maybe it's come in over the last years, over the last decade, 
there is more being written about this kind of context, but it's still very neglected. Most of the research, most uh, most um, teacher education, um, and most, and, and I would maybe include teacher education actually in these contexts, tends to come from theories which have not been derived from these contexts, but co but theories which have been used uh, or, or developed within this kind of context. But the theories tend to be applied into this kind of context within teacher education. Books like Richards and Rogers' Approaches and Methods or Larson Freeman's book, these are, these are very, very commonly used across uh, the Global South in teacher education, various theories, uh, which may not be very appropriate. That's the whole point of Adrian Holliday's work, his book Appropriate Methodology and Social Context in 1994, was um, saying how inappropriate a lot of research and Western ideas have been. We were talking about that yesterday. It underlies the whole reason for thinking about post-method pedagogy or appropriate methodology or decentered ELT, which is what I used at the last conference at uh, Tripuvan University. I don't think we need to worry too much about exact um, differences between these things, but the same, I hope you can understand that we are sharing the same perspective here that um, this is the kind of context that is assumed or researched a lot in the journals and the main journals, but we need more research, we need more thinking and more methodologies which are appropriate in these contexts. So Michael West was just draw, drawing attention to the problem by, by talking about teaching in difficult circumstances. We can we can draw draw attention to it with other labels. We don't need to use the words difficult circumstances, but we do need to draw attention to the problem, to the gap. Uh, we could talk about teaching in low resource classrooms. We could teach, talk about teaching in large classes. This is one aspect actually of the problem, La the large the, the size of the the number. I think sometimes people have thought too much about the size being the the issue, but it's not just size. It's also uh, under resourcing, etc. Um, teaching challenging, challenging context. This is another way of describing it. I, I personally like prefer actually to talk, but let's talk about it in relatively objective way, and say teaching in public education systems in relatively low income countries. Um, so I, I kind of favour this more objective way of um, talking about the kind of contexts that I'm interested in, or that I think we should be interested in. Um, as I say, there are there are some problems with the phrase teaching in difficult circumstances or the phrase um, under resourced classrooms. It suggests some ideal which is not difficult and that ideal being a kind of Western un well resourced sort of um, context. Yeah, or under resourced also sounds like, like it, there's a deficit. There's a there's a negativity about the context which I think we should overcome, as I'll be explaining. Um, but I hope you can see the context that there's not been enough um, research, there's not been enough ideas for teachers in public education systems in relatively low income countries. But the, this is actually teaching in normal circumstances. For many, I think it's probably it's definitely the case that's the majority of English teachers around the world are teaching in public education systems in relatively low income countries. So we shouldn't have to call it difficult circumstances. We should be calling this normal circumstances. We should just be assuming that work in the world of ELT is for these teachers because this is the majority. But, uh, but actually I've written, I wrote back in 2011, it's dysfunctionally neglected. Uh, and uh, I, I still think it, think it is, even though there is, there is more going on these days, as I'll show in ELT and Applied Linguistic Discourse. Okay, so um, we're talking really about n normal circumstances, the normal circumstances faced by teachers in your context in, in Nepal, who are teaching in primary or public or, uh, sorry, public uh, education uh, in primary or secondary and often tertiary um, education. So, um, Okay, so here we see a case where my typing is not that great. Um, but anyway, we're talking about the practical needs for post-method pedagogy, 
practical needs for what Adrian Holder calls becoming appropriate pedagogy. Um, because his book is a really good book, I recommend it still, 1994, Appropriate Methodology and Social Context. He, um, he says we can't just identify some appropriate pedagogy which would always be the same. Uh, pedagogy is always becoming appropriate because in the hands of a teacher we always have to respond to the context and the context is developing so we're always changing and he, he favours a kind of action research approach which is something I also favour and I'll come to but it's something that is changing, adapting to context and contexts are changing. Um, I like the phrase decentered ELT uh, away from um, you know, uh, the global north maybe towards the global south. You might also think about uh, decolonizing ELT pedagogy. I know that tomorrow there's, there's an interesting title of how to decolonize ELT research. Actually, I think I'm, I'm thinking along the same lines in this talk. Well, um, interest in teaching in difficult circumstances actually declined really after Michael West's book. In the, in the 60s, there was a growth of uh, the private uh, school, language school, um, uh, industry in the UK, the UK. Okay. The of university-based uh, English for academic purposes teaching in British universities. Um, together, these contributed to the development of communicative language teaching, which was, of course, uh, in the 1970s and especially the 1980s, was then spread around the world by the British Council as the latest or the best method. And I was personally um, influenced by that when I went out to Japan in 1984. Um, and I thought that communicative language teaching was definitely the only way that anybody should be teaching. Um, but by the end of the 80s, um, teachers at Lancaster, Dick Allwright in particular, and at Leeds, there was Hal Coleman, um, had the experience of students coming to them from African countries, from um, South Asia, and saying, well, the ideas of teaching communicative language teaching sort of mingling in the classroom, for example, or, or pair work where everybody has to only speak in English may not be very appropriate in our difficult circumstances. They, they revived, a, they, they brought up uh, about a project, a research project called the Lancaster Leeds Large oh. Project in an attempt to research and try to find out about the problems Hello. that we're facing in, uh, in classes in the Global South. So, um, so they um, issued some reports around 1989 for about a year or two. People like um, Fozia Shamim, a uh, professor at uh, Karachi University in uh, Pakistan, were influenced by, by, by uh, this project. Actually, I met, um, but it was just a very short project and also it was largely based on the idea that teaching in large classes is a problem that needs to be solved in order to bring about a more communicative kind of teaching. So there was still, I would suggest this assumption that the default way of teaching is a communicative approach, a, an approach originally developed not in such contexts. Uh, it was a very um, centered project in the sense that questionnaires were sent out to uh, countries in the global south and returned back to Lancaster and Leeds for analysis and then projects, then reports were, were written. Um, inevitably, I think, at the, in those days, the internet wasn't uh, invented or wasn't uh, widely used. It was very difficult to keep in touch, maintain contact with teachers around the world. It had to be done by post and um, it, um, it was a relatively centered project. It was also a relatively kind of quantitative approach because that was the dominant approach in those days to research. Anyway, it was also it was also rather short lived. There was a book, um, a good book by Hal Coleman, edited by him called Society, Society and the Language Classroom, which which did have some insights from uh, countries in developing countries. But really, in those days, there was really very little in the journals, in uh, in books which was coming, which was relating to contexts in, in the global, in what I'm calling the global South, South Latin America, South Asia, South, South Asia, maybe African countries. So um, I went out to Pakistan in, uh, in about 2006 or so to give some, some talks. 
I was very interested in learner autonomy in those days. And I, I was giving talks and I was wondering, is it really, <laughs> is it really appropriate in, in a context like Pakistan? So that was what I was interested in. I was also, um, also had some students coming from African countries, Hornby scholars, um, and from Latin, Latin America, and also experiencing the same issue in my own teacher training. I wanted it to be more appropriate mm -hmm. for those teachers in their own context. So I was, I was kind of interested in helping and finding out more what the problems were for, for those teachers. Well, I met uh, Fozia Shamim, and she and I um, thought it would be a good idea to try to set up a, a new research project, a new network. That's what we did. We, we set up something we eventually called um, TelcNet. It still exists. It's actually become quite active again recently. TelcNet, Teaching English in Large Classes Research and Development Network. All of you are very welcome to become members. You don't have to pay anything. It's simply a question of joining a Facebook group where we <laughs> ideas, exchange information. We have a website as well. So this is the uh, website of Telcnet as it was set up in 2008. And I'm thinking, if you're interested, this could be a really good resource for you. There's a, quite a lot of information, presentations, publications, resources for teachers, resources for teacher educators on this website. So you see the website, the website address at the top. It's also, you can go look at it now if you like. It's also um, the, the link is on the PowerPoint slides that I've shared with you, these PowerPoint slides. So that's a short form for the website address. And the Facebook group. So I expect um, you'd like to join that Facebook group as well and continue to exchange. Because these days with the internet, Telcnet is different from the Lancaster Leeds project because we are able to have a community around the world. It's not centered on the UK. It's, uh, it's um, teachers, teacher educators from all around the world. And from the very beginning, we had in the, we had in the lead, uh, myself, Fozia Shamim, um, um, Rama Matthew from uh, India, Harry Kucha from Cameroon, Nigus Nagash, Ethiopia, Prem Payak from Nepal, um, and um, maybe I've forgotten some others, but you, you, the leadership was um, mostly uh, teacher educators from the global south. So on the, on the website, you've got links to many resources for researchers, teachers, and teacher educators. It's not just for large class issues. It's for teaching in difficult circumstances in general, from many perspectives, many different perspectives. Um, although in the early days, because it grew out of, I suppose, the Lancaster Leeds project. In the early days, we were mainly focused on class size, but I would say we're, we're, we're thinking about teaching in difficult circumstances in a broader, broader sense. Um, um, some of the websites, some of the resources are based on our early, relatively focused, um, problem focused research. So I'm going to go through with you some of the research that we've been facilitating within the network and early days um, just like the Lancaster Leeds project we were thinking about what are the problems that teachers face and what solutions might there be so we got a, a list of I did this with a I'm, I'm mainly going to focus on things that I've done because I know main more about those things of course other researchers have done have done other things with a with a student at my university Warwick um, we went through, and also with Harry Kucha, who was a PhD student at that time, we went through the lit existing literature about large class teaching. We identified some of the problems that teachers had reported. Um, and we then um, thought, well, so what challenges did, from the literature did teachers say they face? And for example, here are some of the problems that teachers were reporting. Uh, that we found from reading existing reports or existing re research. But I think what we what we did was, which was a little bit, um, and this is the kind of thing that the Lancaster Leeds project was trying to find out what problems teachers faced. 
But something I think we did which was a little bit um, innovative was to then send these problems to, actually send a questionnaire to teachers and we sent it out through different Facebook groups, through different teacher associations. We got a lot of responses from India, for example, through INET Teacher Association. Um, we asked teachers, first question was, what problems are you facing yourselves? But also, if you have these problems, what solutions could you find to these problems? Because these are, turned out to be quite common problems. And we got some very, very interesting um, ideas back from teachers themselves. And this leads into what I'm mainly going to focus on today, which is the value of asking teachers themselves how they approach issues in their classrooms and how can we identify more successful practices that teachers themselves um, have have developed and how can we use those experiences how can we use those successes to share with other teachers around the world i think this is the kind of a bottom-up approach that i think we need to, we need to develop in this in this area here are some other um, problems before i come to some some solutions. Um, I remember coming to Nepal the very first time I came to Nepal. I was invited by Nelta. I think it was in 2013 or 12, maybe. And my talk was uh, in uh, in Kathmandu and also in Janakpur. And I remember in Janakpur sharing these um, with the teacher with the in, in the plenary. And I invited teachers to come to the microphone and say what they did to overcome these or try to address these problems and there were great ideas coming from the teachers themselves uh, in that plenary um, so i'm not going to share the solutions with you now but i if you go to the website you can see some of the ideas that that teachers from around the world have shared in response to these particular issues particular problems and we confirmed that these are important problems for for many teachers. So here is the part. Here is the part of the website uh, where we. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we never really wrote this up as a research article, um, but uh, you can see the raw data here. Um, the teachers' responses to these challenges according to the questionnaire. And for example, I have too much homework to mark. It becomes almost impossible to give effective feedback for everyone. A very common, a very common um, uh, solution from teachers was peer, feed, peer feedback, using peer feedback. But that was also coming out from, from literature. Okay, so we also um, shared these solutions with, with the teachers who responded to our questionnaire. So we were trying to make the research itself a bit more democratic and a bit more useful for the teachers who, who responded. Okay, that was quite early, early research that we were doing. Um, and you can see that some more solutions. Um, um, so getting written feedback um, to cater for mixed abilities. Well, as I said, um, to find out more about those practical ideas, you, you go to the go to the website. Um, please explore that. So but what I'd like to focus on today, though, is a, a more of a different kind of approach to research, which we developed um, through Telpnet. That was early, relatively problem focused research, um, still thinking of teaching in difficult circumstances as problematic, uh, as full of problems. Um, but we also realized that calling the whole area of research teaching in difficult circumstances was imposing a kind of deficit um cent centrist perspective on the issues of teaching in public education in uh in uh you know in in global south context um and so we wanted to move into a more of a bottom up uh less deficit oriented kind of research where we just accept these contexts as as normal by the way, if, when I say accept, I don't mean that we as um, politically should accept conditions being like they are. Um, um, getting together to argue for change and to for argue for more resources 
uh, with uh, with our governments and with those who can provide more um, um, more resources, of course, is is important. But that is not the focus of our of our network. Our focus of our network is trying to help teachers to, within the context that they are faced with. And we want to move towards a more bottom up, less deficit oriented kind of research approach. So just to say a little bit more about Telpnet's overall ethos, which makes it different from what had gone before. So we do want to contribute to in-service and pre-service teacher education. It's not just research for its own sake. It's very practice oriented research. But the idea is based on bottom up research, building on the experiences that teachers bring and the experiences that they can share. And we're not really into top down training approaches. Um, there's a whole website. Part of the website is devoted to teacher educators. So if you are training teachers or going to be training teachers for public education, um, you might find, I hope you will find useful resources here um, because th such resources are very lacking, have been very lacking. Resources that teacher educators can use to prepare students for the kinds of conditions that they are they're going to be facing rather than just methods which are coming from elsewhere. So pl plenty of ideas there. Um, that you can share with with student teachers. They're also as part of the website, which is directly for for teachers as well. Let's get back to the research. Um, I wrote an article in is actually a presentation at the ITEVL conference, which I wrote up. It's a very short thing, but it's just trying to set out some principles that we might follow in our research within Telpnet. Basically, leaving important to leave behind conceptions of small class teaching as a norm and teaching in difficult circumstances as a problem. And to do that, start with descriptions of practice, in particular good practice, as perceived by participants themselves. Um, very, just an interesting little example. Um, we, one of the questions, once, once we sent out a question through the Facebook group about um, how, I think about how teachers feel about teaching in in a classroom, a class of more than 40 students, say, because I mean, how to define a large class, this is a relatively academic kind of issue. And there has been, there have been lots of people talking about it. I mean, we could just accept that a class over around 40 or 50 is, is a large class. So the question was, how, how do you feel about teaching such a class? And one, I remember one, um, one participant, one teacher said, well, when I when the students are absent because there's a holiday in India um, and there are there are only 11 students in the class, I find that a difficult circumstance. He, he found it difficult to teach just the 11 because he was so used to teaching um, 50 or 60 in the class. So you could conceive, you could say, well, it's not necessarily a problem to have many students in the class. Some some teachers even say it's a it's a good resource because you've got so many different um, backgrounds. Um, we mustn't romanticize the problem, the issue, sorry, the, the, the situation of a class like that, but we don't necessarily want to define it from the beginning as, as problematic. Because we want to maybe focus on positives, focus on what um, teachers can do in such circumstances, not just what they can't do. Um, but basically, yeah, we want to um, support teachers to develop appropriate methodology for themselves, because we recognize that teachers are themselves the ones who know about their situations, the ones who are, if you like to say, experts, experts in relation to knowing their context. And so practitioner research, teacher research is something that we would like to explore as a possible way forward within teacher development to develop teachers own agency to bring about change, to bring about improvement and a qualitative exploratory case study or narrative approach, um, story based. I know that Gary will be talking with you more another day about stories, but um, it, this has been in our approach as well. Um, away from the relatively quantitative questionnaire kind of approach of, of the Lancaster Leeds project. Um, so um, I'm going to try to cover all of these different areas, different ways that we have been doing research and development is with a focus on things that I've been involved in um, over the years since 2008. And there's been a little bit of a development from a 
towards F that I want to try to show you as well. So these are different strands sort of research and development. And um, some of you, I know, some of you have been involved with some of some of these. So I'll be highlighting some of the things that have been done with teachers in, in Nepal. Um, just to highlight some of the early publications, um, Fosia did a, a plenary about the previous research into large classes. Um, that second one is where I was setting out a new direction for research. The third one, Prem Payak, um, he also talked at the same conference as for where I first met Prem. And he was starting to talk about narrative inquiry stories. And I think that I remember that conference was where we really decided within Telknet that we would try to collect different stories of teachers uh, in the context. And we would use that as our main approach at that time in about 2010, 10 years ago. Prem actually was the one who went out and did most of the collection, collection of stories. And I'll, I'll share a story later that he collected from a teacher in Nepal. Uh, but there was also Harry Kucha, who was with me at that time as a student um, from Cameroon. He's now the president of IATAFL, of course. And um, he shared with me a story of his own practice in Cameroon when he was a teacher in primary school with very, very large classes of 200. He then um, talked about this at a an IATFL uh, plenary. But the, we wrote an article about this and um, I think it's rather good article. <laughs> One of my favourite articles because it's based on his story of teaching in a very large class and what he then did to, with the students uh, in terms of um, setting up group work. I'll come to it again later. Actually I'll come to it now because I would say that that was a story of a remarkable teacher, Harry Kucha, and his story has gone further um, but somebody else, Zakia Sawa, you may have heard of. I did an interview with her quite a time ago, 2007. That was during that conference in Pakistan, where I also met Fozia Shamim. Um, she, um, she, she has what she calls a pro-autonomy approach to large classes uh, in Pakistan, where she involves them in project-based project, project -based learning. Remarkable teacher, quite well known. Um, and uh, Harry Kucha also is a, was a remarkable teacher, and his story now is very well known as well. Um, interviews with her, with him, Harry. This is one possible source for inspiration, I think, for what can be done with children or students in large classes. Both of them shared what could be called a kind of pro-autonomy approach in the sense that they were getting students into groups, um, getting them doing projects. Um, it seemed a little bit chaotic in his case at, at first, but um, he, he talks about the writes about, we wrote about the way um, he gradually, it gradually, gradually became more structured and it turned out to be a very, very successful kind of approach. I'm not going to talk about it with you today because you can go and read more by following the links. This was Harry in the middle with some of his students outside under the trees where it was much cooler than the classroom. And this is a, a remarkable um, story of success, really. Well, um, that's one approach, is to go and find these stories of remarkable teachers. But I'm going to suggest in a minute that actually what we need to do is also um, find the stories of ordinary teachers. What do teachers who are not so remarkable do and what can they do? But let's just theorize a little bit from the experience, because I, I do believe in theorizing from experience rather than trying to impose theory onto experience. And actually, our, our whole article with Harry was about that. It was about the fact that he'd, he'd never heard of autonomy. It was only when he came to the UK as a student that he heard the concept autonomy. And then he thought, oh, actually, that's what I was doing. <coughs> Excuse me. That's what I was doing when I was a teacher. And that's why we started to think about his story. And um, that's why the title of the article down at the bottom is From Practice to Principles. It wasn't trying to impose or bring in a new theory. This is why I'm slightly critical about the Kumaravadi Velu approach of going from theory of pedagogy of possibility or pedagogy of practicality, etc theories to into practice. I don't think it really works like that. I like to 
share stories, share examples, uh, and have teachers think, reflect on practice and develop their, their existing practice in my own approach to teacher education and, and research. Well, but still, we did theorize from that and we, we, we noted that it was a kind of pedagogy of autonomy in the case of Zakir Saba, also Harry Kucha. And it does strike me that um, there was, I, I remember a case of um, a, a teacher in Sri Lanka, Gamini Fonseca, who he had no textbooks at all in, this, in a small village in, in Sri Lanka. And what did he do? He got the students uh, memorizing songs and poems that they would carry around in their heads. And they would talk about the poems and songs after they had memorized them. It's not a communicative approach at all, is it? But you could say it's a very traditional approach, but a very, very practical um, approach. And um, you could say a pedagogy of autonomy in some ways. In some ways, he did it, he did it anyway. He called it a kind of rescue strategy. Um, so the, the students had the materials in their minds. Well, um, it does strike me that some of the best teachers do this. Um, they do engage with the students and with what the students already already know and build on what the students already know. And Michael West himself, um, in a radio broadcast, broadcast which you can listen to if you like, on, our, on this website, um, himself said this, the teacher in a big class is forced to realize that language is a thing which is learned by practice. It's learned by the pupils. He cannot, if he is to get results, stand and talk and talk in front of the class. The pupils will soon get restless and anyhow they will not acquire practice in the use of the language. His job is to help the pupils to do the work. And he's got this great um, phrase which he ends his broadcast with, a language is learnt rather than taught and too much teaching can be an obstacle to learning. So it's just to say, well, um, ideas that we think are very new, like autonomy, um, autonomy, they're not always so new. Uh, and we, we can look look to the past and look to great educators of the past, maybe some of your gurus as well, and think about their practices which were successful. We don't always have to think of things in terms of um, method, technique, etc. And he also said, said this, um, the larger the class and more difficult the circumstances, the more important it is to stress learning as the objective, and the higher the elimination, and he, that's also a rather old-fashioned word, um, which he meant dropout, because many of the students were leaving school at a relatively early age because they had to go and work. Their families took them out of school. I guess it, it's probably true in some contexts in Nepal as well. So you never know when the students are going to drop out. And so it's therefore even more necessary than normal to help them know how to learn. Uh, if a pupil has learned how to learn, he can go on learning afterwards. And I think that's quite relevant to our current situation, when suddenly um, we don't have, we're not with our students, and we very much depend on. It's almost like a kind of dropout situation, and we very much depend on their their abilities, or their motivation, to to learn for themselves. Uh, we can't do much about that now. Not directly, maybe. Well, we 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 have to think of new ways, but. Um, it sh probably shows how important it was or to to have engaged them in learning, engaged them in knowing how to learn, if you like, through things like project le project ba project um, based learning, as Zakia did, for example, um, so that they can go on learning afterwards. Um, just one second, sorry. Sorry, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I can't see uh, the chat and I'm, I'm aware I'm talking, talking and talking. Um, otherwise, I might ask questions and ask you to say what you're thinking and please do share your, your thoughts in the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll be able to read them a bit later. But um, the question I'd raise is: we 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 can think about um, we could think about pedagogy of autonomy, we could think about the practice of very remarkable teachers, 
like Harry or like Zakia, but they are quite radical approaches in some ways. And ordinary teachers may not feel that they can engage in such a practice. It may seem rather too radical. Um, and so my question is, should we base teacher training ideas on the practice of very successful, remarkable teachers? Um, of course, they were teaching in difficult circumstances and they can be inspiring models for us. But I think we need to do, we need to do more. And in fact, Michael West said something similar here. And I like the first sentence, we have to find not the best that can be done, but what can best be done, which is a slightly different perspective. The place of the explorer of this problem is not at the front of the class showing what he can do and sort of having a model, but at the back of the class, a big class in a bad classroom on a hot and steamy day, watching what a not too competent teacher can best achieve. If he can do it under these circumstances, others can. Of course, it's a little bit um, sexist because it's just talking about he, a little bit maybe rude towards teachers, but that's how they wrote in those days. Uh, but if you want to f follow up more about the idea of learner autonomy in developing countries, um, there is a reference there to something I wrote recently, but I'm not going to talk any more today about pedagogy of autonomy. Uh, I'm going to really focus more on this idea of documenting ordinary practice. So this is a another strand and it first sort of came up really actually in the in Nepal when I was giving a plenary that plenary I talked about in Janakpur Kathmandu in 2013 and I wrote that up um, in the proceedings um, and I shared I used uh, one of Prem Payak's stories of um, a teacher called Madhav Timlesina in a rural Nepali secondary school so this is I acknowledge Prem's work and I find this story very inspiring. It's a teacher, or you could say an ordinary teacher. It's not a famous teacher at all. Uh, maybe some of you know him, I don't know. But um, I've shared this before, but so I'll, I'll just let you read it, I think. I won't read it aloud, if you don't mind reading it. That's the context. It just shows how the same problems have gone on and on and on for years and years. Of large classes here. So he certainly suffers from problems. He also always hearing about the latest fashion, the latest buzzwords, but he feels well, but we the, those buzzwords don't necessarily take account of the realities because we could also say, you know, teaching difficult circumstances is a useful phrase for drawing attention to realities. We could say teaching in real circumstances as well as teaching in normal circumstances. But he's done some things and this is where his story turns quite interesting. He talks about dropout and repetition means repeating the class. And these are the same issues that Michael West talked about. Of course, um, Nepal is a very rich, diverse, uh, linguistically and culturally country. And I know that sometimes you have you have students from different um, communities in the group, in, in the class. And I think that's a great little paragraph where he, you know, not from not from any theory, but basically from his experience and his um, openness to his students. He um, uses the students as a resource. And there's a lot in this, I think, in terms of a kind of appropriate pedagogy. Um, people are often talking about this in Nepal, but he was actually doing it without any theoretical background. And I think this often happens that really, you know, teachers who in many contexts around the world, they don't necessarily have the theoretical knowledge, the applied linguistic knowledge, but they are good educators. And I, I mean, I think we need to recognize that that more and find those people, find those teachers who who are making things work and, and maybe theorize 
as researchers, maybe try to find theories based on based based on those practices. It's a completely different way of thinking about research than normal, where we go from theory uh, and see if they see what gaps there are with theory. Usually, it's a more of an enhancement approach. Is what I'm going to talk about. It's a, it's 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 building on good practice that is already going on that we don't see. So um, another problem is, um, well, not a problem. Um, it's, a, it's a practice of, of very, very common, actually, that I've discovered among um, teachers in large classes of trying to get um, certain students to help them as almost like monitors. And that, that's a very old approach as well. Um, it goes many, back many, many years to have students helping the teacher. Finally, an issue here of not being able to reach all students. And this is what um, Tim Lissima does. And so, um, so this is final words here. Large class size is not only a problem or burden, but also an opportunity to explore new techniques and tools. And I think this is a key, a key sentence in relation to the Telknet approach, really. Um, that um, okay. So what's this story show? It shows the value of an enhancement approach. Firstly, a value of an enhancement approach to research and teacher education. I'll define what I mean by enhancement approach as opposed to deficit-based approach. It shows perhaps also the potential value of sharing a story um, as inspiration for other teachers or as content for teacher education. Um, there's a possibly a basis in, in stories, narrative inquiry, uh, for post-method pedagogy. I'm just using the phrases that Gary Barkhuizen might use or Kamala Vadivedu might use. So we implies maybe an enhancement approach to research and to teacher education, where we build on successful experience as defined locally by teachers themselves. Secondly, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Secondly, I think the story shows the importance of teacher agency. This teacher is very agentive. He's, he's taking things into his own hands. And in that area, we might talk about teacher inquiry or teacher research. So it shows the agency of a teacher in difficult circumstances. He's not a victim of those circumstances. It confirms, I think, the idea that we need to build on teacher, build teachers' confidence in their own ability to find solutions, help teachers develop agency, encourage teachers to experiment and inquire. So these are the two, two areas I'd like to explore a bit more with you, the area of an enhancement approach to research and teacher education and the area of um, teacher agency uh, being developed through teacher inquiry. Because this is what I've been focusing on re over the last five or six years, these two areas in a very practical way, but I think developing a, a kind of approach. So fast forward, um, we can refer to this publication um, and I'll refer to this now. There's also a video resource which goes together with this. It's not exactly a research article, it's not a research article, it's a collection of stories and a collection of experiences. But I think it shows the, the value, theoretically as well, of an enhancement approach and of um, valuing teacher research. So an enhancement approach or a sharing successes model, as opposed to a deficit-based or a theory-driven model of, of research and of teacher education. I just thought of this this um, phrase, this definition, maybe identifying, describing, understanding, and building on successful practice as locally conceived. That might be a a short uh, way of describing what uh, what an enhancement approach might involve. In practice, let's have another. Yeah, so an immediate application of stories like Tim Lucina's in teacher education could be that you gather such stories, and that we take parts of their story and we come up with questions for student teachers or for other teachers within in-service or pre-service training, like the question at the bottom. Um, we can use such stories to have teachers reflect on their own experience and to share their own ideas. 
And so it's coming from the ground up, coming from the bottom up as an input into teacher education. But within the book that I mentioned, it's based on a workshop that we held in Nepal again in 2013, together with Amal Padwad from uh, Ambedkar University in India. as a British Council Hornby uh, workshop with teachers from Bangladesh, Nepal, India and Pakistan, who were themselves teachers in low resource classrooms. The title of the workshop was Teaching in Low Resource Classrooms. So Amal and I, rather than bring in ideas from the outside, we wanted to work with the ideas that the teachers were bringing, the successes that they were bringing. So it's an example of an enhancement approach. And to take that a little bit further into encouraging them to inquire, find out a bit more to develop their agency or autonomy as teachers. So it, it brings together the enhancement approach idea and the um, teacher inquiry idea of uh, teacher education and research. So uh, this was the group of teachers, quite a small group, but we also wanted to bring together, and you can see Sagan Shrestha there in the back background, you can see some other Nepali teachers you might recognize. Um, and we wanted to also bring this towards a publication because we wanted the publication to be a resource for other teacher educators and teachers because there's a lack of such resources. And that's what we eventually did with this book and the associated video materials. So we had, uh, you, you must know um, probably um, jo Jovan from uh, the British Council there, he helped us. And so um, we started with teachers sharing stories of success and we were lucky to have five days together with the teachers. So we spent about a day or a day and a half just asking the teachers to think and share a successful learning experience and to reflect about the experience. <coughs> so this could be a model for teacher training, could be for research as well, um, to find out more what teachers uh, in your networks uh, feel about teaching. So we have teachers sharing, you, you know Lakshmi there, I guess. Um, here's Lakshmi again. And um, sharing stories in different ways. Um, in a pair, then sharing somebody else to a pair, to a different pair, then finally presenting the story. And st the teachers themselves said that this was a very um, confidence boosting, empowering experience. It was, it was starting with something positive and it was then able to share with others. And the others said they learned a lot from this, from because the teachers were teachers who shared their contacts, they, they knew their contexts. And the video of some of those presentations is on the British Council's website. So it's also a good resource for, for you as teacher educators. Um, we could put some questions together with the stories into the, in the book. So again, this, we wanted this to become a good resource for teacher educators. And I should say that um, Sagun um, took this much further and he set up um, workshops. I think he was quite inspired by this idea in his own teacher training, Sagun Shrestha, and also set up two, so far, two success story conferences uh, in Kathmandu. And they invi invited quite a lot of teachers to take this idea forward. So it's been a good, um, good idea and uh, could be expanded more in different contexts as a, as a form of teacher development. So um, well done, Sagun, for, for doing that. And um, I think that, that that illustrates the value of, a, of an enhancement approach, the value that teachers themselves see in hearing stories of successful practice from their colleagues who, who know their contexts, much more than somebody like me coming from the UK and telling them, well, this is how you should be teaching. It's coming from the bottom up. But it hasn't been uh, very, very common in the field of ELT. So it's a different approach. It's a more bottom-up approach. I've also been um, very involved with ideas of um, um, encouraging, helping teachers to do teacher research. Now, research sounds like not really what teachers themselves would want to do. It's, they think it's what academics do. They don't feel it's really for them. So a lot of this initially is 
showing teachers that actually it can be for them. And I think, again, sharing examples of teachers who have done some inquiry, some very small scale inquiry is the best way to go, is not to tell them they have to do it, not to tell them lots of theoretical models of how to analyze data, etc., not to use lots of jargon, but to do it in a very, very down to earth way. But we have found teachers who have been involved in teacher research have found it to be empowering and a way of addressing t difficult circumstances, not some not an added burden in their already difficult circumstances. So um, if you allow me to speak a little bit longer, how, how, how long can I speak for if you give me an uh, idea? So I think there are more questions here. They're putting the queries also. A lot, many more questions are here. So can I speak for five more minutes? Okay, okay. We have a time till seven. Um, but uh, I think they will ask the questions yesterday also their, you know, their, their queries, their curiosities have not been more, you know, they, they were excited more. So to tell me um, how many more minutes I can speak. Okay, five minutes more. Okay, so teacher research, um, we have some definition of teacher research, but it started off in this workshop in a very small scale, very low, low key, um, just asking teachers to share their problems turn the problems into how can I questions. And this is something useful for teachers to, to turn a problem into how can I, for example, Miriam here from Pakistan, I have too much homework to mark. It's impossible to give effective feedback to everyone is a kind of dispirited, hopeless statement. We can turn it into a hopeful statement by saying, how can I provide feedback to students? What are the different forms of feedback that I can use? And questions like these are the beginning of a, of a kind of research journey, because she could then in the workshop go and ask other teachers what they suggested. So she could get uh, advice from other teachers. And then they shared in the workshop itself what other teachers had told them. Well, we didn't call it research. We just said, this is what we'll do in the workshop. But sometimes some of the teachers said, is this research? And I said, yeah, this is research. This is the beginnings of research. So we don't even have to use the word research. But in the context of, um, of Latin America, um, we've developed a particular approach to research, action research, which we call exploratory action research. Again, to gradually introduce secondary school teachers to inquiring into their practice as a way of addressing difficult circumstances. We've written quite a lot of things uh, relating to this approach, which we think is appropriate. We know is appropriate for, for teachers, many teachers, not all teachers, but many teachers find this useful and empowering in secondary school contexts in public education systems, because teacher research has not been developed for them in the past. So these books for the British Council have come out. You're very welcome to go and find out more by browsing these books. And of course, it's Chile, that's in Chile. Important questions for teachers. I mean, that question has become even more important now nowadays. So these were already important questions for teachers, which were not being addressed by research, by academic research. So they can develop questions that they can then explore. And we will go over that quickly. You can go and find out more. But um, it spread to India and in the arms project in British Council project in India with that, um, and also Nepal. And I've been involved, very, very happy to be involved with the projects in, in Nepal over the last three years. And I've been mentoring mentors. Um, so, for example, uh, you've got stories um, that Janak Singh has put together in a book which is freely available. And I think some of the insights that the teachers are sharing here, like um, this teacher, uh, are useful for other teachers in Nepal, as well as for the teacher themselves, teachers themselves. So we go back to large classes. She had came up with these research questions, obviously with the help of Janak. And she asked, she asked a colleague to observe her class. She discovered that this, she, she felt there was some disruption in the class. She wasn't quite sure what it was. It turned out from observation, it was the students over there on the right 
near the windows because they were looking out of the windows and then they were talking then other students were talking to them and saying what can you see what are you doing so that's where the disruption was she didn't know that before and um, so she planned action to give more responsibility to the students sitting nearby the windows and she went close to them as well to make their talking uh, stop them talking with their friends so she she sort of walked, went closer like this and that that seemed to solve the problem so it's a very down-to-earth little project but it shows how how teacher research can be a very practical thing uh, in difficult circumstances it can help a teacher to explore what the problems are stand back from the problems and find a solution so it's showing teacher agency it's showing a way that teachers can address problems of difficult circumstances okay final thoughts i know i don't have i have two minutes maybe what about those were those con those conditions we've been thinking about and those different kinds of research were all very relevant i think when we were talking about normal difficult circumstances but we're facing you are facing super difficult circumstances if your circumstances or your teacher's circumstances were already difficult they are now super difficult and what i mean by that is whereas um whereas in the west maybe we're thinking here in britain about how can we get students online how can we do online teaching that's not really so easy when students are in the very difficult circumstances super difficult circumstances of not having access to internet for example very important issue that needs to be addressed so difficult circumstances are not the same everywhere some places have super difficult so i'm just finished up by thinking aloud whether uh, anything we've done in telnet is relevant and i think it possibly and i've only just been starting to think about this but i think it is still relevant the approach that i've been outlining because i think when we think about the current situation it's true still true that we need to leave behind conceptions originally i said small classes but now i would say leave aside the ed tech you know the, all of these ideas that are being shared these days online and i think all of you have access online and are trying to find out about how to do online teaching all of the discourse over here is about this but we shouldn't necessarily think of that as a norm and we need to start with descriptions of what teachers are actually doing in Nepal and it, we're only at the beginnings of this and um, in, in situations where students don't necessarily have connectivity at all so not a deficit model but a building up from where teachers are doing what teachers are doing is sometimes quite interesting um, they're contacting parents for example explaining to parents what parents could do by telephone for example um, again we do need to focus on issues that are concerned to teachers themselves and not impose new burdens onto teachers and say you, sh you must be using uh, online zoom for example um, we do eventually we'll need a qualitative narrative approach i think it's all relevant uh, perhaps some of these strands of research may be may continue to be useful it would be very useful to have stories of teachers remarkable teachers in this context autonomy i think is relevant documenting what's going on is very relevant um, sharing successes of teachers is relevant uh, moving into teachers inquiring into their current practice um, and something i didn't talk about at all actually i forgot to talk about was teacher associations taking control of research and doing joint research something that um, nelta has started to become involved with i didn't have time to talk about that and within Telpnet, all I, I'll just end by saying that we have started to have try try to continue with some of these approaches by having some discussions. We had our third discussion on Friday, and you are very welcome to join in. Um, we 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 are learning from teachers in different countries what are the problems that they are facing, and in that way, um, building from the bottom up and not imposing any kind of solution onto teachers. So that's been the theme really. Um, of finding out where teachers are um, what teachers are doing what successful teachers are doing from their own perspectives in order to uh, find ways forward 
for addressing what we might call difficult circumstances, but which are actually normal circumstances for teachers around the world. But now, of course, uh, uh, non-normal circumstances, super difficult circumstances. So I'll, I'll end there. And thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Richard Smith, uh, for